First we have Mr. Edmund, Georgie's advisor, introducing Georgie Pierce. Thank you. I've been so blessed to serve over the last three years as the advisor to a young lady who truly lives out Country Day's motto of the scholar, artist, and athlete of character. Georgie Hughes is a diligent student and an accomplished equestrian who has made her mark on campus literally behind the scenes as she's run our theater tech group for nearly every production that we've put on in her time here. When the sound lights and set changes operate to perfection, Georgie is the mastermind behind it all. Our advisory is also a huge beneficiary of her willingness to take responsibility as Georgie is the one who organizes our advisory food schedule, takes ownership of our group's community service participation, and volunteers whenever anything needs to be done. Most importantly, as one of my advisees put it, Georgie genuinely cares about everyone. You're all going to love her story. I give you Miss Georgie Hughes. Okay. My number was 67, roughly scribbled on tape, and carelessly applied to three bottles. They weren't bottles you would easily imagine, but rather bottles with a past. They were made of thick, mottled green glass with odd plastic stoppers on their tops. They had been used hundreds of times, monotonously, to feed me Georgetta, number 67. Every day, they were filled with a grainy liquid that comprised my only nourishment for the first eight months of my life. I was born in Romania. My circumstance resulted from Nikolai Ceausescu's dictatorship. He was executed in 1989 at the end of the nine-day revolution, six years before my birth. But he so thoroughly pillaged the country that Romanians paid a heavy price for years afterwards. In 1995, people were still so impoverished and desperate that thousands of children, like me, became wards of the state. I lived at Moriah Blasse Children's Hospital in Bucharest with dozens of other orphans. My birth mother, Aurelia, placed me there. It's not that she didn't love me, she wanted to give me a chance to thrive. Almost three years younger than I am now, she had no way to care for me in her poor farming village, and no way to escape the harsh scrutiny and judgments of her family and neighbors. I was loved. My parents tell me that when I was handed over in the middle of a beautiful September night, my caretakers hugged me tenderly. They cried because they would miss me and overjoyed that I was on my way to a better life. The average weight of a healthy nine-month-old is 20 pounds. Though it's hard to imagine, I weigh only 12. Of course, I don't remember my first year, but I know the experience is deep within my being and part of the fabric of my character. I believe my instincts for survival are what saved me then and give me strength and focus now. During the rehearsals of Much Ado About Nothing, I loved when Dr. Port, Dr. Rock Report exclaimed, she's small, but tough. It's the truth. My small stature is deceptive, causing some to underestimate my persistence and determination. In the orphanage, crying in tantrums didn't get me food or a clean diaper, so I became self-reliant and patient. I didn't fuss. Instead, I entertained myself by listening and observing. It's a lot like I am today. Whereas most babies' lives are saturated with color and texture and, and all sorts of gadget, gadgets to capture their attention, my early surroundings were very basic and barren. I have never been for a stroll around a neighborhood or traveled in a car. For weeks after I arrived home in San Diego, I continued my habit of dancing my hands in front of eyes, which I apparently did to save me from boredom. It took my parents time and patience to transfer my interest to the wonderful world around me. However, I immediately responded to music because songs were sung to me and recorded music filled the rooms where our cribs were housed. Music is one of my earliest memories, which makes it so ironic that my family is in the radio business. For my bat mitzvah, I decided that instead of receiving personal gifts, I wanted to raise money for three different organizations. I chose Voices for Children in San Diego, Freedom Riders in Maine, where we have a home, and Casa Montessori, the first ever Montessori school in Romania. It is located in the poorest section of Bucharest and dedicated to the most needy children. That same summer, we traveled there so I could know where I was born. We visited the classroom that had been outfitted with the monetary mat materials I was able to provide. Upon seeing the children, I was thrilled that I had made such a difference. It was better than any gift I could imagine. To see the joy on their faces when playing with their new toys made me very happy. It also got me to thinking that if I had not ended up with my parents, would I have had the excitement of experiencing new toys? Another amazing moment was seeing the hospital where I was born, in the very room where I met my parents. 
Today, that building is in such disrepair, it is no longer used, but it gave me some sense of that September night. Throughout our journey, my parents and my sister Sally kept asking how I felt and what it was like for me to visit my roots. I didn't know how to explain it. All I could conjure up was, what if I bump into my birth parents or brother or sister? My hopes are that they still think of me often. Since I have been blessed with this wonderful life, maybe my mission is to help others through community service or my theater work. When you start out with nothing, you tend to pay attention to all the little things. Maybe that's why I have a dark sense of humor. I'm struck by the absurdity, absurdities that escape others. I often wonder why my classmates are racing to get to the end so fast. I want to take it day by day and enjoy the trip. Most people look back on their high school years and remember that all the ugly things that were done to them. If you weren't popular, it was like you didn't exist in the way of cliques, parties, and boys. I wouldn't say my time in high school has been tough, but I've been excluded when groups form and party invitations are sent. On the outside, I pretend like it doesn't bother me, but when I'm alone, I puzzle over why I'm not included. It's petty, really. Am I not pretty enough? Is my wardrobe not scandalous enough? Am I known in that crowd as the girl you don't invite? Being the most popular isn't going to matter in 10 years, or even in college, but it would be, ni but it would be nice to be thought of for a change. My advice to those who understand my view is to remember that you can do anything and be anything. High school is just a blip in your timeline. Don't get stuck there. Fortunately, I found my passion unexpectedly and I've dedicated the majority of my time to it. Theater is one of the only places where exclusivity is not an option. Every cast and technical crew member must work together as an ensemble to produce a fully functional piece of art. When a production reaches the stage of perfection, the actors and techies become one. Mr. Felcher always reminds his students and actors to remember why they're on the stage. Each person can have a personal reason, but the one that sticks to me is that the audience wants to be included as well. Maybe it's no accident I took a liking to theater. It's also kismet that I have one of the strongest relationships and friendship with my mentor. Ms. Bay not only teaches me how to be the best stage manager and theater artist, but also the best person I can be. I will always cherish the silly conversation about boys and the heart-to-hearts we've had about friendships, relationships, relationships, and life in general. In the film, Inside Hannah's Suitcase, Auschwitz survivor George Brady said that his greatest retaliation against the Nazis and the loss of his family was to live fully and joyfully with passion and purpose. I didn't experience loss like his, but he made me think that this might be my legacy too, because I have an extraordinary life. I'm a happy person and plan to make the most of my opportunities. When writing this speech, I struggle to find the right words to tell people who I am. I think I have offered a pretty good insight. Some of me is too complex to be shared in words, but I relate to this quote by author Salman Rushdie, <laughs> who, what am I? My answer, I am everyone, everything, whose being in the world affected was affected by mine. I'm anything that happens after I've gone, which would not have happened if I had not come. I've gone, uh, sorry. I, have, I am anything that happens after I've gone, which would not have happened if I had not come. Nor am I particularly exceptional in this matter. Each I, every one of the now six billion plus of us, contains a similar multitude. To understand me, you'll have to swallow the world. Lastly, I want you to know that my bottles traveled home with me, or they sit openly on display, serving as a link to my past and a reminder of what's possible. I didn't have an easy start, but I am grateful for what's followed. My name is Georgetta Brianna Hughes, and 67 may just be my lucky number.